So it should surprise you that biology is a scientific discipline, and all scientific disciplines involve some sort of process. You may have this vision of science, and you'd be wrong. That's not really what science is. So I want to start out with just talking a little bit about what exactly is science. And really, I'd like you to participate here, and I'd like you to give me an idea of what you think science is. Because you maybe are thinking, I'm going to mix up a bunch of really cool stuff. So what is science? Say that again. Explaining math. Okay, that's actually not a terrible definition. So really, what science is, in the, the term or the word science, it's, it's derived from a Latin term. And that Latin derivative means to know. And really, science, in, in one sense, is a way for us to think and to develop knowledge. It's a way for us to know something. And obviously, there are a lot of disciplines in science. Science is sort of a big umbrella term. And we can know about the natural world. And that may be something like physical science or um, meteorology is a more specific type of physical science. Or we can know about the living system, that may be biology, or some more specific um, sub-disciplines of biology we can arise out of that as well. So science is this idea to know, and then we have disciplines like biology, chemistry, physics, and physical science, and meteorology that are all disciplines and sub-disciplines. They're basically the lens in which we look through with techniques and thought patterns that help us to know and understand specific things about the world that exists around us. So if science is the way to know, and we know that there are sub-disciplines, we can also provide the definition of biology. So what is biology? Perhaps this is going to be a little bit easier for you to explain. So what is biology? Okay, so we might simply just define it as the study of life. Um, I'm going to expand on this a little bit. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit more uh, of a definition, a little bit broader definition. Now, first, it's a science. And specifically, as we've already mentioned, yeah, it's science and the study of life. But it's actually more than that. We can further define the term in how and why it's done. And it's a natural science. This is going to be one of the qualifiers that we can apply to biology. It's a natural science. And a natural science is any of the disciplines of scientific inquiry that seek to know the laws that are over nature. For the most part, even when it seems very unpredictable, the natural system works in very predictable ways. If we need a cell to divide, it's going to follow some very specific steps, and we know what those steps are. And it was biologists 300 years ago that began to let, look at that natural system of the cell and began to say, okay, what are the rules that are applied or that overlay mitosis or the division of and we can look at that, look for those laws all over the biological system. What happens when we release a bunch of testosterone into the bloodstream? What happens to the muscle? It's going to follow some very specific patterns, what we call laws. I'm going to take this a step further. It is a natural science, but biology in itself 
is what we would call a magpie discipline or a granddaughter discipline. What that means is biology on its own doesn't really stand by itself. It requires parent disciplines to feed into. In one sense, we can say, and this is probably the best single definition of biology, is that it's the chemistry and the physics of living or apply to living systems. So you might think, why the heck do I have to take chemistry? Why the heck do I have to take physics as part of my degree? Are you raising your hand or are you going to <laughs> Why is chemistry and physics part of the degree program for biologists? Well, really because biology is simply a applied form of chemistry and an applied form of physics. And if I take it even a step further, you also have math in your degree programs. Why the heck do I have to take math? And it all falls out here. If we start with math, which in one sense I think I can define that as language that God uses to communicate. So math is a language. If I take the language of math and I apply it, I would call that applied math. One form of applied math, we could also call this physics. It's using mathematical models to understand rotation of protons and electrons and things like that, to understand the atom in one small sense. Then I can take that applied math, or my physics, and I'm not going to call it applied applied math, but I'm going to call it applied physics. If I apply physics, I get chemistry. And then I take that chemistry and I apply those principles to a living system, and now I have our biology discipline. And if I take biology and I begin to apply it, I have disciplines of applied biology. I would argue that most everything else in science is just a form of applied biology. Uh, I know there's a couple of people who are interested in exercise science. Exercise science is a form, is a form of applied biology. You look at the subdisciplines of biology, marine biology is a form of applied biology. You look at molecular biology, it's a form of applied biology. It's taking those principles that govern the natural laws of life and it's applying them to understand those distinct subdisciplines. So that's why you have math and physics and chemistry and biology courses inside of your degree program. Because one goes on the other and goes on the other. The other thing that's really important here too is when you look at all of this, math may not be your strong suit. That doesn't mean you can't be really good at math someday. When I look at all of this, one word comes out to me. And that one word is wonder. This is what drives me as a scientist. I am curious. Sometimes I'm so curious that it hurts me. But I'm curious and I have that wonder. And if you want to survive in a degree program in science, you have to cultivate that wonder. Dr. Wallace Atwood, he was uh, president of Clark University, which is in Worcester, Massachusetts, back in the 1920s. Uh, he also had his scientific underground uh, underpinnings in the discipline of geology. He was a rock He was sitting in northern Minnesota with another um, uh, contemporary at the time, I thought, contemporary environmental scientist named Singer Olson. The two of them, he's 80 years old at the time. 80 years old, and they're sitting around a campfire in northern Minnesota, and he's just mesmerized by this chunk of granite that you saw from the northern North, North Slope, uh, which is a granite formation in northern Minnesota. And he's just looking at it. And Sigurd Olson looks at him and says, you're 80 years old, but you look like you're a first year graduate student. How do you do that? And this is what I want to pass forward to you. This is what you need to begin to cultivate. What he said, and I'm um, hopefully going to remember this right. He said, 
never lose the power of wonder. Never lose the power of wonder. You can keep that alive. You stay young forever. If you lose that, you die. So be captivated by your pursuit of your science and your Be captivated by looking at these principles and saying, what if I do this? What is that? So never lose that power of wonder. Maybe you don't have that wonder. And I would argue maybe you're in the wrong place for it. Are you scientifically dead today? Hopefully not. So I'm going to shift gears here just a little bit. Um, and, and one of the terms that, that I've already thrown out there was this thing called the scientific method. Again, this is one lens that we can use to help guide the scientific process. It's probably, if you've ever been taught anything on science, it's probably the best of science inquiry that you've been taught. In, uh, previous education. Um, scientific method, really what you're looking at is it's a way to organize. It's a way to organize your thought and your wonderment, and it's a way to progress from question to question to question, trying and seeking and finding those answers. So it's a way to organize. It's a process. Now, really, we sit on the edge of the night in modern scientific inquiry. And the reason I say that is because the scientific method, it should be this rigid, well-defined process. And questions should lead to question, should lead to question as you answer those questions. And it should be unbiased. And it should be all of these things so that the inquiry is honest, data-driven, experimental. But we sit on a minute because that's not the way that it's really done anymore. Half of the scientific community may do it that way. But there's a lot of the scientific community that's not doing it that way. And the outcry of depragmatizing, I don't know if that's really a word, basically taking away the practicality of the process leads towards a lot of the, uh, the issues that we have in science today with fabrication and falsification of data. And, and basically lying is what it comes down to. So, the scientific method that you've all been taught, and you know about hypotheses and all that kind of stuff, and we'll go through a little bit more of that in just a few minutes. But before we can get there, that process, it's supposed to be rigid. But I would argue that, by and large, in its current form, it's a lot looser than that rigid intended form. So just some examples, there are shortcuts that people take. There are certain steps that you need to do to, to understand and to, and to get specific uh, assays. And there are certain steps that are just sort of thrown by the wayside. And I can give you a really real example. I was asked to review an article. That's one thing that scientists do is you go and do research, and then you send it away to a journal when you get it published. But before it gets published, it goes through this process called peer review. We're going to talk more about peer review this semester. And basically, they have an expert. I don't know if I'm really an expert or not. But they ask an expert in the field to review the new scientific discovery before anyone else sees it. And I just was asked yesterday to review a brand new article. And I'm reading through this article. And I found three fatal flaws right away in this article. And they were all about the way that the science was being done. Just forgetting about certain parts of, of assays that are really, really important to have really good, confident data being generated. And so that's exactly what I'm talking about. 
just forgetting things. Oh, we won't do that. It's not really that important, but it's critical for the validity of the data. There's actually some other. Um, this is just a little cartoon before I introduce. Uh, there's a really big case, and you maybe have heard of it. I'm going to go through it here in just a second. Uh, but basically, here's the old scientific method. Formulate a hypothesis, accumulate data, do an extensive experimentation. The new scientific method, formulate a hypothesis, patent it, raise $17 million. And so we're taking it out of this wonderment and this, this old method that was based off of scientific discovery and the drive to learn something new to, we got to make money on this deal. Whenever you get money involved, which I'm not saying that science can't be money driven, but when it's the only thing that drives it, there's a lot of, I mean, it's the basis for a lot of wars around the world. It's the basis for a lot of unethical business behavior all over the world. As soon as you begin to put money in the very pinnacle of whatever you're doing, it changes it. And it becomes this completely different thing. And this is what's driving it now. Right now, the budget for the NIH, National Institutes of Health, which is one of the federal agencies that oversees biomedical research, and they fund biomedical research, is $32 billion. It would be really nice to have a piece of that pie. Fortunately, here at TMC, it's not about publishing or perishing. If I don't ever publish another article in my life, it's not really that big a deal in terms of my employment and truth. For me, it's a big deal because I want to be an active member in this idea of expanding the knowledge. Other institutions, if you don't publish regularly on a regular basis, you lose your job. That means you lose your ability to pay for your family, take care of your kids. And so it always comes back to money. Think about it. You've got to pay for your kids. You've got to make sure you can feed your kids, right? They're the most important people in your life next to your, your spouse. And if you can't take care of your kids and you realize that, you're going to begin to compromise. So rather than it being driven by discovery, it's being driven by money. And it forms this really loose form of the method, the scientific method. And so we end up with considerable ethical and legal and moral adversities. Considerable ethical, legal, and moral adversities. And so you might say, well, Dr. Bowen, what in the world are you trying to say? I'm saying that rather than being driven by wonder, driven by data, we're making decisions on what to do, how to bias our data that are ethical, that are illegal, and that are immoral. So unethical rather than ethical. The rates of fabrication right now is astounding. In fact, there's one area of science that you're going to learn a little bit about this year, one area of, of biology. It's called polymerase chain reaction. It's an assay that we use to quantify RNA and DNA. Okay, so this is just a way for us to measure the quantity of RNA. How many specific RNA molecules are there for, let's say, a gene like aromatase, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. So you can use this technique to quantify RNA and DNA. Right now it's estimated that 99% of all of the data that's out there that's utilized real-time PCR is probably incorrect. 99% that's out there is not showing the real story. A lot of that is fabricated. Some of it is just because they're really bad statistics. Another area that we can look at that maybe you've heard something about before in the past is the fabrication of, uh, of data related to embryonic stem cells. There are a lot of people who are very hopeful that embryonic stem cells will turn out to be what the report is be, which is basically a cure for all kinds of diseases. If we can program tissue from the embryonic stage to replace the pancreas, we may be actually be able to head diabetes. We may be able to eradicate diabetes. Don't miss the gravity of that. 
Now, there are other ethical uh, other ethical questions that we should drive into the conversation as well, especially the idea of embryonic things and it requires embryos to be in the same sort of portion. But just ignoring that, this area of inquiry has radical implications in disease and rates of diseases uh, across the board, across the whole human population. Unfortunately, it's taken some hits, and actually, really, for some of us who are post embryonic stem cell research, it's good that it's taken these hits. Uh, there was a guy, his name was Wu Sak Huang. Not an American. He was actually a South Korean scientist. And he was involved in what's known as a fraud case. Here is a picture of Dr. Huang. Um, this was before, this article on him was written before he became implicated in this fraud case. Uh, and he was a huge star in embryonic stem cell research. Because he was one of the first people to show that embryonic, embryonic stem cells can be utilized to produce a variety of different types of tissue. This was back in about 2003 and 2004 that he um, had actually done this. Here we are now in 2009. So that last article was from about 2004. Here we are five years later, 2009. You can read the title of that paper. So here's our rising star. He's now been convicted. And they're saying it's not a fraud. It turns out it really was fraud. Uh, but he was convicted of some other things that came alongside of that, including investments in research dollars in South Korea. So this is just one example where the drive for money, or the, the need of money, drove one individual who is a rising star in, in biology is now being convicted. By the way, since this article has been published, they don't know where he is. He's just gone. He's probably, probably honestly, was killed by his own training number, or he's been exiled someplace that nobody can find. Okay, so I'd argue that we have that loose form, but I still think that there is an ideal form, a form that this is what we desire out of our students here at TMC. We desire you to look at science practically, and we desire for you to use rigid, skeptical thought, and we desire for you to be systematic. And most importantly, when you do something and you tell somebody you've done it, hopefully they can repeat it. So we want it to be ideal, uh, in, in an ideal form, rigid, systematic, and repeat. So you say, okay, this is what I did, and I can take and I can read over and I can go over to my lab bench and I can do the whole study and get the exact same. Now, we said the scientific method, we said it was a process, right? The scientific method is a process, but it requires some sort of way to think through that process. And so kind of hung on top of the process of the scientific method, we have a model for thought. In other words, if this is the skeleton and this is the process that we call the scientific method, how we think through each step of it each of the steps of the scientific method. And so we can model that process of the scientific method. And the, the most common way to work your way through the process is to follow what's known as the hypothetical deductive thinking model. And 
here is that model. This is the, the hypothetical deductive reasoning or, or, or thinking. And really it starts out with that curiosity. And we make some sort of observation. One of the first observations that I made as a scientist is that if you remove the testicular tissue from a male mouse, you obliterate its wheel running response, its physical activity. And that's really important because physical activity is related to all sorts of chronic diseases. If you have a higher level of physical activity, you have a lower incidence of cancer and heart disease and obesity and diabetes and back problems and chronic um, psychosis and all other types of chronic diseases. So I made this observation and I didn't just watch mice running on wheels, it was based off of other history that had been um, scientifically investigated. But it drove me to a question. And the question really was, why? Why, if you remove the, the source of testosterone, does it obliterate a physical activity pattern in mice? That question, which you're going to begin to practice this today in lab, asking questions, scientific questions, should drive towards a hypothesis. And you've all heard of hypotheses before. Anyone remember the classic definition of a hypothesis? It's an educated guess. You probably have all heard that before. So it's an educated guess. And educated just means that it's based off of history. A lot of things have already been done. And they give us an idea on how a mechanism may work. So in my here, here my example of wheel running in the presence of low testosterone, there's literally a hundred years of science before me before I even began to ask that question. And so I based my hypothesis off of those hundred years that we've already seen. I was asking questions that were directly related to all of these. Uh, another way to look here at the hypothesis, not just as an educated guess, but as a description. And that description is how does something happen? So my question here, I might actually ask, uh, ask a question like, is the reduction of testosterone's interaction with the androgen receptor leads to chemical changes that induce physical activity patterns in mice? And so I'm giving this description on how it may actually happen. It may be this reduction in the interaction between testosterone and the receptor and leading towards some cellular changes. Maybe a muscle to muscle could be in the reward center of the brain. But the point is that the question you ask is what drives the hypothesis. And so the hypothesis is sort of this description of how it happens. So either it's going to happen this way or it's not going to happen this way. It's a very binary thing. It either happens the way you described it or it happens some other way, which would be not the way that you described it. You're not really seeking out, okay, this is how I think it happens, and if it doesn't happen this way, then it could happen this way, or this way, or this way. You're basically saying it could happen this way, but if it doesn't happen this way, then we have to look at something else. And that's my next story. So a hypothesis should really come with five important characteristics. So really, we should have five important characters. So as you're building hypotheses today, think about these five characteristics. First, it should explain something. So it should be explained. A hypothesis is not just some random statement. It's a statement explaining what you think is going to happen. Just like the definition suggests here, it should be educated. Just to kind of expand on that a little bit more. It 
It's educated when it is based on previous experience. Have you ever heard the term standing on the shoulder of giants? Anyone? This is the idea that there were people who have come before us in history who have been mega thinkers. They've come up with brilliant ideas. They are giants in the field. And now you, as a new biology student, you get to stand on their shoulders, meaning you get to stand on the discoveries that they've made, the conversations that they've had, and you can look for them. You can look for the next major discovery. So it should be educated based on experience, based on what's been done in the past. It should drive towards multiple explanatory ideas. Now let me clarify this. I'm not saying that you need to explain a phenomenon in multiple ways. I'm saying hypotheses should be designed in such a way that they're not just singular. It's going to happen like this. It understands that it can happen like this, but if it doesn't, it happens some other way. Because if you get into this situation where like, it has to happen this way, what happens if it doesn't? Where do you go from there? It's always recognizing that there's an explanation that may or may not be right, meaning there are multiple other possibilities, and we should be thinking about those. Number four is pretty critical. It has to be testable. And what that means is you have to be able to answer the question. You have to be able to generate data that either supports or negates the hypothesis. And I would take this a little bit further, this idea of it being testable, and I would say that it has to be testable by current methodology, instrumentation, and technique. You could design a hypothesis and you could say, oh, I think that, I guess I'll use Will Running, just because that's my favorite phenotype. I think that mice will run more if they're given additional testosterone. And I'm going to inject testosterone. Guess what? Injecting testosterone is not the latest step. I'm talking about taking a needle, coming in the mouse, and injecting them. The latest technique is using an implantable device that releases the testosterone. The reason that you have to be thinking about the testability using current methodology, instrumentation, and techniques is because older technology and techniques, they're not all bad, but some of them induce additional uh, compounding variables on your data. When you inject a mouse, you have to have daily contact with that animal. When you have daily contact with that animal, it increases the level of stress which can mask or manipulate the natural responses. So we do one surgery on them, and then we leave them alone, and we don't have the daily interaction. Forty years ago, injections were the standard in that field. Today, it's implantable devices. So we should design and test our data using the latest and greatest technology. Or at least, I should say, the technology that's going to be the most beneficial towards understanding your technique or your uh, uh, experiment. All right, number five here, the hypothesis needs to be conditionally acceptable. And what that means is there has to be some sort of condition that's met that says, yes, this hypothesis that we designed, this is getting in the right direction. So we don't design hypotheses that don't have some sort of condition attached, that if you meet this, then this happens. Okay, so we're dealing with this thing called the hypothetic, the ethical deductive reasoning or thinking model. And we dealt with the hypothesis side of the equation, but then there's also this deductive part. So what exactly does that mean? And this idea of deduction or deductive 
is this notion that we're going to have a design set of observations. And those defi that defined set of observations is what we're going to use to deduce our limits. It's what we're going to use to generate a conclusion. So it's a fine set of observations that are used to generate a conclusion about our hypothesis. Now these observations, these have to have some very specific characteristics. Does everybody have all the details here? We need to generate these observations from well-designed experiments. If you're looking at the chemical composition of, I don't know, some chemical, uh, some oil, let's say, oil, and you're eating a peanut butter sandwich and you get a little bit of peanut butter in there, that's not a very well designed experiment. Because now you have the yeah, gas. Right? So we want our well designed experiment to address all possible confounding variables within reason. There's always going to be stuff that comes up that, oh, I didn't think about that. I didn't think that, that would happen, but it did. So not only do you have to have a well-designed experiment, but you also have to be, in one sense, uh, adaptable to new situations that, that come up. And that really comes to having these well-designed experiments generating their observations to be properly controlled. If you want to know some sort of drug treatment treats cancer, then you're probably going to want to give that drug to a group of cancer patients, and you're probably going to want to give a placebo to a group of cancer patients, and compare what happened in those two groups. You aren't just going to want to give it, give that drug to cancer patients and say, oh yeah, none of them have uh, big tumors anymore. Well, what would have happened if we treated uh, a group with a different drug? Is this drug better than that drug? What, what about the standard treatment that we're currently using? You can't answer any of those questions unless it's properly controlled. You also have to have enough samples. There's this little thing in science called significance. Your discoveries have to be based off of significance in order for us to say, hey, that's a really great discovery. The only way to do that is to have enough samples. So that cancer treatment example, if you have just two people in one group and two people in the other group, there's not enough people. You probably need hundreds of people in each of those groups. So you need a large enough number of samples or individual generating data to make any sort of real decision on that question. I've already sort of said this a little bit, but a well-designed experiment is going to incorporate up-to-date technology. The way that they used to measure blood pressure is they took a big long tube and they cannulated that tube in through, um, usually this was done in things like horses or something like that, and they cannulated that tube into the left ventricle of the heart. And they would hang, they do it outside, and they'd hang this big long tube off of the tree. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound really experimental to me. That sounds actually kind of dangerous. But that was the technology that they had at the time. Today, we have all kinds of devices. We can put transducers, pressure transducers, directly into the heart, inside of a sterile environment that are going to give us really, really good ventricular pressure data. Uh, and it's very non-invasive. It doesn't. It's not a dangerous thing for us to do. So we have up-to-date technology for measuring blood pressures in very unique ways. So your observations need to be based off of 
proper control, enough samples, and using up-to-date technology to generate that data. We also need to talk a little bit about the characteristics of a good experiment, which is where I will pick up on Friday. Any questions as you're packing up? I don't care if you take notes on your laptop, and I don't know if you noticed or not, um, but I actually just recorded all of it.